أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين This is our fifth episode uh, in our series Introduction to Rajal Studies In the last lecture we discussed the pretext behind uh, under what pretext do we refer to a Rajali scholar? And we mentioned six. Number one, we refer to him because he's a reliable narrator telling us a story of this person's reliable, that person's not reliable. Two, it's a form of testimony. Three, it gives us one, what a Rajali scholar tells us, it gives us presumption. Four, it's a form of fatwa. We take his word for it as a fitwa. Fifth, it gives us certainty or assurance. Qat or atma'inan. And sixth, uh, a Rajali scholar is a specialist. And we refer to him because he's a specialist. And I mentioned in the last uh, lecture that this is the opinion that we support. And others have accepted this as well. For example, uh, Al Shaykh Al Mamagani, in his famous compendium, Tanqih Al Maqal fi Alm al Rajal, this is his view. And perhaps our teacher, Ayatollah Shaykh Muhammad al Sanad, that is also his view. We refer to a Rajali scholar because he's a specialist in the field. And uh, normal human beings, rational people, uqala, they refer to, to the specialists in every field. And because Najashi, Kashi, Tusi, and others, even later scholars, al mutaakhirun if they are considered as specialists in the field, we may refer to them. Now, this theory faces several problems. And there are serious problems that we need to fix. Otherwise, we cannot build upon this theory. One of the major problems is posed by Sheikh Asif Muhsini, a contemporary scholar of Rajal, in his book, Buhuthun Fi Alm Rajal. He says that the reliability of a narrator is something that is felt by the senses. Amrun hissi. You can feel it. You can feel if this person is reliable or not reliable. Either you've, you've, you've experienced it or you've tested that person and you've discovered, you've discovered, for example, that this person is unreliable. This is something hissi. You could feel it. You could sense it. Anyone with sound senses, his senses work, will discover that this person is reliable or unreliable. When we refer to a specialist, we don't refer to a, a specialist on things that are sensed, that we can sense ourselves. Umur hasiyah. No. We refer to a specialist on things that cannot be sensed but need to be reasoned, need to be derived. Umur ijtihadiyya. We refer to a specialist to take his opinion, not to take his piece of news. Remember what we said in, in the previous lessons that Qawl al Rajali, what he says, is it an opinion or is it a piece of news? Is there a difference? Absolutely. A piece of news is not an opinion. It's something that you saw or you heard. Or you heard from people who was passed down to you generation after generation. But an opinion, an opinion is not a piece of news. It's something that you've analyzed, you've done your research, you've gathered information, you've gathered pieces of evidence and you reach the conclusion. That is an opinion. It's an opinion. You could call it a fatwa if you want. A fatwa is a judgment. It could be a, 
a, uh, a judgment of a doctor when a doctor tells you you have to take this medicine that's a fatwa but it's a medicinal fatwa when a lawyer tells you you have to do this that's a fatwa that's a legal fatwa from a lawyer he's not telling you a piece of news he's giving you his judgment he's, gi he's giving you his opinion and there's a difference between giving news and giving a judgment passing a judgment giving an opinion Sheikh Asif Muhsani says that you refer to a specialist on an opinion, on something that requires an opinion, something that requires a judgment, something that requires gathering of information, gathering of pieces of evidence, something that requires analysis, and then you receive a fatwa. But the reliability or lack of reliability of a narrator, it doesn't require analysis. It doesn't require gathering of information. It doesn't require gathering of proof and evidence and clues. You either know that this person is reliable or you don't know. You've either sensed it or felt it or you haven't. So you don't refer when you want to see if this person is reliable or unreliable. There's no specialist. Specialists, you refer to specialists on things that require clues and knowledge and evidence and analysis. You don't refer to a, a specialist on things that are available for everyone. For example, today, is it hot or is it cold? You don't need to refer to a specialist to tell you that. You could discover that yourself. Children could discover that themselves. If today is hot or today is cold, what day is it today? Is today Sunday or Monday? You don't refer to a specialist. That's, some, that's common knowledge. Basically, the reliability or lack of reliability of a narrator, that's common knowledge. Anyone can sense it. Anyone can feel it. Anyone can know it. You refer to a specialist on things that you don't know yourself unless you go and study for many years and you become a specialist yourself. But al-wathaqa, reliability and lack of reliability, it's not like that. It's not something that requires a specialist. This is what Sheikh Asif Muhsani posed as a problem. And indeed, this is a, a significant problem that requires an answer. Do we have an answer? Yes, we do. We have four answers to answer a Sheikh Asif Muhsani, this highly respected scholar. Number one, we believe that Rajali scholars, when they tell us that this person is reliable or that person is not reliable, this is an opinion. This is not a piece of news. This is a judgment. We are referring to them as specialists. These Rajali scholars, they're not uh, telling us this person is reliable or not reliable just because they saw or sensed from a narrator that he's reliable or not reliable. In many of the cases, they did not even see these narrators. And Najash never saw Zurara, and he never saw Muhammad ibn Muslim, and he never saw Yunus ibn Abdurrahman, but he tells us that they're reliable. How? Because he saw them or heard them? Or because they gathered clues and evidence? Or, for example, when they tell us that this person's unreliable because they saw them and they witnessed them? No, sometimes there's a, a hundred year, two hundred year gap between them and those narrators and transmitters. So how is he telling me that they're unreliable? We believe that he's gathering clues and evidence and he's analyzing. He's analyzing their traditions, their narrations. It's a, a, it's a complicated process of analysis and research and gathering of clues and finally he reaches a conclusion. So this is one. We believe that what they say it's based on their ijtihad. It's not based on their senses. And we will discover that in the days to come and in the, in the lectures to come. We see them sometimes authenticating certain narrators and transmitters based on their narrations not because they saw them lie 
or not lie, they told a lie. No, based on their narrations. If they narrated things that they feel are, you know, what we would say dodgy, something that doesn't make sense. For example, for example, they'll say, we saw Imam Sadiq fly in the air. For example, they'll say, no, no, this person's a liar. Because that can't be right. That can't be right. This person is a liar. They'll judge the narrator based upon his narrations. Not because they saw him lie or not lie. Not because they met him face to face and they discovered that he's lying uh, you know, directly. No, they judge it upon his narrations. So they're gathering clues and evidence. They're analyzing his narrations to reach a conclusion whether he's reliable or not reliable. So this tells us that they're not basing it on his, they're basing it on hats. What they're telling us is not a piece of news, it's an opinion and a judgment because it's based upon gathering of clues. It's not based upon their senses while uh, you know, they saw the narrator and they discovered that he's lying or that he's not lying. No, it's not like that. So this is one. Two, some things, some pieces of news, some things that are hissy, that are felt, they still need a, a specialist. Sheikh Asaf Muhsani says that the things that are felt and sensed, they don't require a specialist. You cannot refer to a specialist when there are things that are felt and sensed, like the weather. Yes, you'll refer to a meteorologist, a specialist, to tell you what is exactly the weather today. Is it 40 degrees or 38 degrees? But is it hot or cold? You don't need a specialist. Some things do need a specialist, even if they're felt. They need a, a specialist. Which kind of things? The things that are felt and sensed, but only for a group of people, not for the majority. For the majority of the people, they're not felt or sensed. They don't have access. Only some people have access. Others don't have access. Let me give you an example. For example, there's a, a merja that no one sees except his family members. His height, his weight the color of his eyes, the color of his hair. Do these require analysis? No. They don't require an analysis. These are things that are felt and sensed. You could see them. But no one has access other than his family. His family, they become what? Specialists and experts. We rely on them because they are the specialists. Because they are the experts. We refer to them we have to take the word for it. So if he says my father is ill or not ill, my father is tall or he's not tall, whatever he says regarding his father, we take it. We have to take it because they are the specialists, because they are the experts. Although it's something that any of us could discover if we were to see, but we don't have access. And the reliability or lack of reliability of certain narrations, it's the same. We don't have access to them. Our only access to them is through these Rajali scholars, Najashi, Tusi, Keshi, Ibn al Ghadari, and so on and so forth. We don't have access. There's over a thousand years, over 12 centuries, a gap of 12 centuries between us and them. We have no other access to discover whether they're reliable or not reliable other than these Rajali scholars. So this is two. Three, who said that the reliability or lack of reliability of a narrator is something that is felt and discovered easily? No. We disagree with Sheikh al muhsani Sheikh al muhsani says that the reliability or lack of reliability of a narrator is something that is felt and sensed immediately. You can sense it. You don't need to gather clues. Amrun hissi la hatsi. 
لا اجتهادي You don't need to perform اجتهاد and gather clues to discover if a person is reliable or not reliable You could tell immediately You could sense if a person is reliable or not or not reliable We disagree We disagree We believe that you have to gather clues and evidence to discover if a person is reliable or not reliable That is why some people for many years you think they're reliable all of a sudden after five, ten years you discover they're not reliable and vice versa some people you thought they're not reliable but they turn out to be reliable some people after a while you discover that they're not reliable you had to gather clues and evidence maybe his story did not you know it didn't uh, check check out in this case and in that case you have to gather clues and evidence sometimes you can't know for a fact for example he tells a story but that story doesn't make a lot of sense you can't really tell if he's lying you can't tell he's lying just because it didn't make sense you could be telling the truth that's only one piece of evidence and then you gather another, and a third, and a fourth, until you reach the conclusion that this person is unreliable. Or that this person is reliable. So it is a matter of gathering clues and evidence. It's not a matter of, matter of sensing it. It could be some people are so unreliable that from the first thing that they say you discover they're unreliable. And others, they're very discreet. They're very secretive where you can't tell, are they reliable or are they not reliable? This will require patience, it will require time, and it will require gathering of clues and evidence. And finally, the fourth reply to Sheikh al muhsini is that there are certain things that in the beginning, they require gathering of clues. But due to experience, they become things that are discovered easily. So in the beginning, some things could be hadsi, uh, but then later on, due to experience, they become hissi. But we, you still refer to that person because he's an expert as a specialist. Let me give you an example. Doctors. A doctor in the beginning when he or she graduates, in order to diagnose an illness, they gather clues and evidence. So, for example, you go to a doctor and they want to see if, do you have this illness or you don't have that illness? First, they take your blood pressure. They'll listen to your chest do you have coughs or you don't have coughs? They might make you go and take an MRI exam or a CAT scan or you might need x-ray. You might need to have uh, your blood examined, a blood exam, a blood test. Once they gather all of this information, once they have all of these examinations and tests, they've checked your blood pressure and they've checked your that there's a blood exam, blood test, you've done your MRI, you've done your x-ray, you've done your CAT scan, you've done all of these exams. Once they put all of these evidences, pieces of evidence or proof together, then they'll tell you, listen, we believe you have this illness or based on the results, you don't have this illness. But this doctor, after 10 years, 20 years, 30 years in practice, do you think he'll still need all of these exams and test results? No. Because that illness, he's seen so many people with that illness that he could tell right away. Right away. And I've seen doctors like that. As soon as they see you, as soon as they, you know, they check your blood, blood they don't even need to put on the, uh, the, you know, the stethoscope or whatever it is. Uh, they just check your blood, blood pressure, they check your vein, 
and they tell you you have this illness or you don't have that illness. It becomes natural. Something that required clues and evidence now doesn't require clues and evidence. They could discover it right away. Something that was hissy becomes hatsi. I'm sorry, something that was hatsi becomes hissy. But do we still refer to a doctor as a specialist or we don't? Of course we do. Just because it became hissy for him, something that he could tell right away, does that mean that we don't refer to, a, to him as, a, an, as an expert or a specialist? No, on the contrary, we'd prefer to refer to him because now he's a, he's a full-on expert where he could tell and give you answers right away. He doesn't need clues anymore. And the same goes for, for example, detec detectives in detecting a crime. If there's a robbery, in the beginning, in the early years of the career, that investigator needs to collect a lot of clues and will require them months in order to discover a crime. But as that person grows older and gains expertise and experience, that person can discover a crime within a matter of minutes. You could say that it's this person or that person with very minimal clues. So this problem by a Sheikh Muhsini can be solved. Now, we have two other problems that we face in referring to a Rajali scholar. And these two problems we will try to summarize in the next couple of minutes. This problem says the following. When you refer to a Rajali scholar, do, we, do you refer to him as an expert or as a narrator? In other words, is he giving you an opinion or is he giving you a piece of news? And both of them have problems. Let's take the first. You are referring to a Rajali scholar because he's giving you an opinion. Now, if, it, it's, if it's a person from the laity, a lay person that refers to a Rajali scholar, that's not a problem. But if a jurist wants to refer to a Rajali scholar and takes his opinion, isn't that taqlid of him? Isn't he performing taqlid? of that Rajali scholar, while a mujtahid, he has to do all of his research. You can't rely upon others in his ijtihad. I'm trying to de derive a law. Anything that I need to derive that law, I need to go and research it. I can't rely on the research of someone else. Otherwise, that becomes taqlid and not ijtihad. Well, first of all, this is partially true and partially not true. I cannot rely on the research of another jurist. As a jurist, I cannot rely on the research of another jurist <clears throat> if it's on the important premises of my argument. For example, I cannot rely on the understanding of another jurist when it comes to the Qur'an or the narrations, a hadith. This is, I have to employ my own understanding of the Qur'an and hadith. So when it comes to fiqh, usul al-fiqh, I cannot rely on the principles of another scholar when it comes to usul al-fiqh. For example, another scholar relies on ijma'. So I rely on him. I say, you know what, ijma', I could rely on ijma'. Why? Who said? I said, because that scholar said so. I didn't do my own research when it comes to ijma'. Can I rely on ijma' or can I not rely on ijma'? I can't do that. That becomes taqlid. Because these are important premises for my process of derivation. However, there are some premises that are not important, that are well researched in other sciences that I may refer to others. For example, in tafsir how this verse has been interpreted. Can I rely on scholars? Some say you can. When it comes to logic, mantiq, I don't go and do my research in mantiq. What a mantiqi scholar tells me, what a logician, so to speak, tells me, I take for granted. 
and I build upon it. Or even scientists, if a scientist tells me that so-and-so, I'm not going to go do my research in science. A mujtahid, that's, that's not his field of expertise. He relies on scientists, he relies on economics, scholars of economics, and so on and so forth. If it has to do with his ijtihad. And that's fine. Experts can rely on other experts. Just like doctors. A doctor, why does he refer you to a CAT scan specialist or an MRI specialist? And he relies on his report. When you go and perform an MRI, they give you a report. You take that report and you bring it to your doctor. And based on that report, your doctor tells you what to do. Does that mean he's doing taqlid of another doctor? No, he's still, he's still an expert. Because there's so many fields out there and there's so many specializations out there, there's no way you could specialize in all of these fields. No way. When it comes to Arabic grammar, as a jurist, he's not going to go do research in Arabic grammar. He's going to take the, the laws of grammar as is, as it's given to him. He's not going to go and do his research when it comes to grammar. Is it this way or is it that way? No. There's a set of laws in grammar that he's going to take for granted. And so too, when it comes to Rajal, he's going to rely on a Rajali scholar when he tells him that this person is reliable or that person is reliable because he's the expert. No matter how much I research regarding, for example, Zurara, Najashi is still going to be the expert. He's going to be more knowledgeable than me. Tusi is going to be more knowledgeable than me regarding Zurara or others. I'm not going to beat him in that field. That, that's his field. So, that is fine. Although he's an expert, I still may refer to him. The other problem, <clears throat> also posed by a Sheikh Asif Muhsini, he says, if we were to rely upon a Rajali scholar, not, not as an opinion, but as a piece of news. I will rely on Najashi and Tusi when they tell me this person is reliable or that person is not reliable. Because he's giving me news. And we have to remember there's at least a 200 year gap between Najashi and Tusi and the narrators and transmitters of hadith. 200, 150 maybe 150, 100 years at least, between them and the narrators, the companions of the imams. So they didn't see the imams. Supposedly, it was news that reached them, passed from one generation to the next. So at the times of the imams in Ahl Bayt, there were companions that recorded, they wrote books on the credibility of certain narrators. This person was credible, that person was not credible. This person is credible, that person is not. And these books, they were abundant and they were passed from one generation to the next until they reached Najashi Antusi. So when they tell us this person is reliable, he has a source. He has a chain of narrators. Tusi has a chain of narrators that are telling him this person is reliable and that person is not reliable. But the problem is, when we refer to the book of Najashi and Tusi, they don't tell us what their source is. Najashi simply tells us this person's thiqa. That person's not thiqa. But what's his source? We don't know. This is a problem. It's like a person who did not see the Imam. He did not see the Imam. He came 200 years after the Imam and he narrates a hadith taken by the Imam. There's a 200-year gap. How can he narrate from the Imam and he came 200 years after the Imam? He has to mention his source. He has to mention his chain of narrators. If he doesn't, this is called Mursal, Hadith Mursal, meaning the chain of narrators is unknown. And we cannot, narr we cannot rely on a Hadith Mursal. We cannot narrate, we cannot rely on a Hadith where it doesn't have a chain of narrators. Or it does, but we don't know what it is. Najashi and Tusi, they don't tell us what their source is, what their chain of narrators are. So this is a problem. This is a problem for whom? For someone who accepts 
قول الرجالي he accepts the words of a rajali on the pretext that it, it's a piece of news. It's a reliable person telling us a story, a piece of news. So people like Sayyid al-Khoi will fall, will face this problem. Sayyid al-Sistani tried to fix the problem. He says that Najashi and Tusi, when they tell us this person is reliable or not reliable, based upon numerous reports based upon numerous reports and so they don't need to tell us what the source is when it's numerous reports for example if a hundred people tell you that so and so politician is corrupt you believe that that person is corrupt that politician is corrupt and you say it in one of your lectures do you need to mention a source? you don't need to mention a source because a hundred people told you. It's a num numerous reports. You don't even need to cite your source. Sayyid Sistani says that Najashi and Tusi, they had numerous reports, they had numerous sources, so they don't need to cite their sources. Shaykh Asif Muhsini, he says this is not correct. Because if there were numerous reports, then why do they conflict Tusi and Najashi sometimes? Najashi authenticates a narrator. Najashi says, no, that person is not reliable. If there were numerous reports, they, re they should reach the same conclusion, but they don't. In fact, sometimes they conflict with themselves. Lucy, in one of his books, he says, this person's reliable. In another book, he says, he's not reliable. If it's based upon numerous reports, why would he conflict with himself? Why would they conflict with these with each other? Shahid al Sadr, he also had Shahid Sayyid Muhammad Baqar al Sadr rahmatullah alayhi, his he made an effort to answer. He says that it was clear for them. Kana wadhahan. Najashi when he says this person is reliable, that person is not reliable, because it was clear for him. Shaykh Asaf Muhsin he says, What do you mean by clear? How was it clear for him? Do you mean there were numerous reports? Well, we already answered that. What do you mean by clear? And how could it be clear when they both conflict? If these new reports were clear, so why, do, why does Najashi and Tusi sometimes they conflict with one another? My humble answer, and by the way, Sheikh Asaf Muhsini, he says that if someone gives me the answer to this problem, I will give him a sum of money. And incidentally, I met a Sheikh Asaf Muhsini several months ago here in Karbala, and I told him, I hope you've brought a lot of money with you because I have an answer. Uh, of course, he laughed and he didn't accept my answer, but I will say it. For me, it's convincing, but for him, it might not be convincing. That this problem is based on a wrong pretext. That Najashi and Tusi, they're not citing their source, and so we cannot accept what they say because they're not citing their source. And if they don't cite their source, how can we accept what Najashi and Tusi say? That means we cannot even accept Alm al Rajal. Alm al Rajal is, becomes useless because it's based upon unknown sources. This is all based on a wrong pretext. And that pretext is that we are relying on Najashi and Tusi because they are reliable narrators giving us a piece of news. But if we base it on the pretext that we accepted, they are specialists, they are experts. An expert, you don't ask him for your source. You don't ask him for your proof. You don't tell him what is your source. No, an expert is an expert. When you go to a doctor, you don't tell him, why do you think I have this? Or why do you think I have that? No, he's telling you his expert view and you, you accept it, whether you like it or you don't. Or you could refer to another doctor. You don't ask him for his source. So it depends on which pretext you accept. If you accept the pretext that says they are experts, Ahl al Khibra, then you don't need to ask for their source. And I will conclude here. And inshallah, in the next episode, we will discuss the later scholars of Al Marajal, Al Mutaakhirun. These scholars, Najashi, Tusi, Ibn al Ghadairi, Kashi, they were the f scholars of the formative period. 
But after 200 years, other scholars came. They're called al mutaakhirun the later scholars, like Al-Alama, Al-Hilli, and others. Can we rely on them when they authenticate certain narrators or not? This will come in another episode, inshallah. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin.